hello my viewers and welcome back to my channel in today's video we take a look into the complex narrative surrounding claims of asians hating black people now in this insightful exploration we address the unsubstantiated allegations fueled by a well-funded misinformation campaign which unfairly scapegoats black individuals for anti-asian violence now we hear directly from members of the asian community who debunk these assertions emphasizing that at an individual level there is no inherent hatred between asians and africans however our investigation uncovers a deeper issue lying at the governmental level particularly in south korea where visa policies towards african countries reveal systemic challenges that need to be addressed so join me as we unpack the nuances of this narrative and shed light on the real obstacles hindering positive intercultural relations check out these videos i will be right back Nope, this is not true. This claim, unsupported by facts, is the result of a well-funded misinformation campaign scapegoating black people for anti-Asian violence. The president, who spread anti-Asian rhetoric that led to the increase in anti-Asian violence, not black. Robert Aaron Long, not black. The guy in New York City who attacked seven Asian American women in one afternoon, not black. We are done listening to oppressors tell lies about the people whom they oppress. And while Asian Americans did experience the greatest percent increase in hate crimes, do you know who experienced the greatest increase in incidence of hate crime during that same period of time? Black people. And the majority of people who commit hate crimes against black people is the same as the majority of people who commit hate crimes against Asian Americans. We know who the common denominator is, so stop with the divide and conquer. Thank you, Ms. Page, for commenting this. Um, to be honest with you, at the individual level, Koreans don't hate Africans. That is not the real issue here. The real problem is that at the governmental level, South Korean government is not very friendly to African countries when it comes to issuing visas. That is the real challenge here. For example, there is no single country in Africa that signed the MOU on the KEPS, meaning that none of the citizens in, in Africa is eligible to work in the field of non-skilled professions in South Korea when there are so many of you guys willing to work in such fields. Also, except for a very few nations in Africa, most citizens in Africa would need C3 visa to South Korea just for traveling. You guys will have to prove to the South Korean government that you have certain amount of um, balance in your bank account along with the requirement that, that you guys have to uh, submit your criminal record check just to be eligible to travel to Korea. Also, when there are quite a few uh, countries in Africa where the English is the official language, the citizens of South Africa is the only people that can teach English here in South Korea, which is discriminatory right? Discriminative uh, against you guys that speak English as your official language. Lastly, mm, Koreans tend to, um, you know, subtly despise those people from those countries where the GDP per capita is relatively low. Uh, Koreans don't say it out loud on the surface, but I cannot deny that there is tendency for South Koreans to, um, you know, have a little bit of contempt for those people uh, with 
low GDP per capita. And there are many more issues other than these factors that I've just mentioned. But hopefully uh, this is informative to you guys. So how do we move to South Korea? The best bet is to start schooling first. I mentioned this in one of my previous videos. So hopefully you can uh, go check out the video. Anyways, um, thank you for listening. I'll come back to you guys with more of the relationship with the South Korean government and the African countries. Uh, have a great day. This comment was left a couple of months ago, but I only just saw it, and it was left on a video in which I discuss how Asian Americans can participate in both racial discrimination, which is interpersonal bigotry, as well as racism, which is contributing to systemic racism that oppresses black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color. And this ability to contribute to systemic racism that oppresses black people is important in the ongoing discussion of why Asian American owned businesses operating in black communities are problematic. The most well known way that Asian Americans can contribute to the oppression of black people is through the model minority myth, which states that Asians can be experiencing things like oppression and poverty, but they're quiet, hardworking, and they don't protest. And because they have strong family values that emphasize things like education and hard work, they're able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and go from poverty to prosperity, often in one generation, proving that the American dream is true. The negative implication oppresses black people because it says that if other oppressed groups are not able to achieve the same result, the problem is not systemic within the United States. The problem has to be cultural. What's important to remember is that the model minority myth is exactly that. It is a myth. It involves perpetuating stereotypes and manipulating data to create a misleading picture. And it also oppresses Asian Americans who don't fit the model which tends to apply narrowly to East Asians who are affluent and often who have paler skin. An issue right now is that there are Asian Americans who are actively contributing to spreading misinformation about anti-Asian violence and who the perpetrators are. And this is oppressing black people by putting the blame on them, which leads to more policing of black people. And it's an unfortunate reality that the United States has a history of weaponizing the positionality of Asian Americans to oppress black people. And this goes all the way back to the 1800s when post-emancipation plantation owners thought that they would recruit Chinese laborers to create competition between Chinese laborers and black laborers and hoping that the Chinese laborers would undercut the black laborers. This competition really didn't come to fruition because Chinese laborers and black laborers did not fall for the divide and conquer. They demanded the same wages and when the Chinese laborers weren't given that, they left. And unfortunately, I think what the United States learned after that is to make sure that that type of solidarity and mutual respect never happened again. So starting in the 1950, we see the manufacturing of the model minority myth. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act passed. And then in 1965, the United States opens the door to Asian immigration, which again puts Asian Americans in the way of opportunities that should have gone to black people. And with respect to indigenous people, I basically feel that anybody who is not advocating for native sovereignty and for treaty rights to be respected is oppressing indigenous people. Now, this video brings attention to a crucial topic, the intersection of racial perceptions and governmental policies within the Asian community, particularly in South Korea, where it's true that there is no inherent animosity between Asians and Africans at the individual level. Now, it's important to acknowledge the systemic challenges that exist. According to reports, South Korea's visa policies towards African countries have indeed been criticized for being stringent and sometimes discriminatory. For instance, a study by by the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy found that South Korea grants fewer visas to African passport holders compared to other regions. Now, this imbalance in visa issuance can perpetuate the perception of unfriendliness towards Africans, even if it's not rooted in personal animosity. It's crucial to highlight the broader context of anti-Asian violence and the misinformation campaigns that exacerbate tensions between different communities. Instances of violence against Asians, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, have sparked fear and suspicion, leading to scapegoating and misplaced blame. By addressing these issues with factual evidence, 
I feel we can foster a more nuanced understanding of the challenges faced by various communities and work towards constructive solutions that promote inclusivity and mutual respect. Reports from various sources, including government agencies and international organizations, highlight disparities in visa issuance between African countries and other regions. For example, a study by the United Nations Development Program found that African passport holders face greater difficulty obtaining visas for travel compared to passport holders from other continents. In the case of South Korea, specific data on visa issuance to African countries compared to other regions can shed light on potential biases or discrepancies. Examining South Korea's broader diplomatic relations with African countries can provide insight into the motivations behind visa policies. Factors such as economic ties, political considerations, and historical relationships may influence visa issuance decisions. Analyzing official statements or diplomatic initiatives regarding South Korea's engagement with Africa can offer a more comprehensive understanding of the context in which visa policies are formulated. Now, insights from civil society organizations, human rights groups, and advocacy networks can also contribute valuable perspectives on the impact of visa policies on communities of African descent in South Korea. Report surveys and testimonies from individuals affected by visa restrictions can highlight the real-life consequences of these policies and contribute to informed discussions on potential reforms or adjustments. Comparing South Korea's visa policies with those of other countries, particularly within the Asian region, can provide a comparative framework for evaluating the fairness and inclusivity of visa regulations. Understanding how different nations approach visa issuance for African travelers can help contextualize South Korea's policies and identify areas for improvement or alignment with international norms and standards. Now, watching this video is both enlightening and frustrating. It's reassuring to hear members of the Asian community debunking the false narrative of inherent animosity towards black individuals. However, the revelation of systemic challenges at the governmental level, particularly in South Korea's visa policies towards African countries, is disheartening. It's concerning to learn that despite individual goodwill, institutional barriers persist that hinder positive interactions and opportunities for collaboration between our communities. The disparity in visa issuance statistics, coupled with reports of discriminatory practices, underscores the need for greater scrutiny and advocacy for policy reforms. I feel it's important to raise awareness about these issues and work towards fostering dialogue and cooperation with Asian counterparts. The broader context of anti-Asian violence and misinformation campaigns underscores the interconnectedness of our struggles against discrimination and prejudice by standing in solidarity with one another and amplifying each other's voices. We can collectively challenge stereotypes and systemic injustices that perpetuate division and hostility. Understanding the historical relationship between Black and Asian communities can provide context for current dynamics. For example, in the United States, there have been instances of solidarity between Black and Asian activists during the civil rights movement, as well as tensions stemming from economic competition and stereotypes perpetuated by mainstream media. Recognizing the intersectionality of identities within both the Black and Asian communities can deepen our understanding of shared experiences and challenges. Factors such as gender, class, and immigration status intersect with race to shape individuals' experiences of discrimination and privilege. Despite institutional barriers, there are numerous examples of cultural exchange and collaboration between Black and Asian communities worldwide. From music and arts to activism and academia, recognizing and celebrating these connections can foster empathy and solidarity. Expanding the discussion beyond South Korea to other countries with significant Black and Asian populations can provide a broader perspective on intercultural relations, for example, examining the experiences of Black expatriates in Asian countries or Asian diaspora communities in predominantly Black nations and shed light on the complexities of multiculturalism and identity. Highlighting grassroots initiatives and community-led efforts to address artism and discrimination can inspire collective action and solidarity, whether through advocacy, education, or cultural exchange programs, empowering individuals within both communities to challenge stereotypes and advocate for systemic change is essential for progress. We have come to the end of the video. What do you have to say? Share your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you for watching and see you in my next video.